Wiseman back with us, CEO of SoundCloud, one of the few return guests that we've had on the Traffle podcast. And it's great to have him back because I feel like so much has changed since the last time we talked. When we talked, SoundCloud was in a very different position. But now, since that time we had you on, this was fall 2019, you've had your first profitable quarter. You've had plenty of big announcements, investments as well. And I think a lot of people would look at it as one of the success stories since then. And I'm curious from your perspective, what would you attribute a lot of that change to with SoundCloud? Wow. Well, first, thanks thanks for having me on as a second time guest. I'm honored. Uh, still remaining a long time reader, listener to your work, Dan. So appreciate that. I think the uh, the continued success of the business is uh, attributed to a couple of things. It's one, it's we're always trying to do things differently, trying to innovate where we can. What we call, what one of our sort of key tenants at SoundCloud is we try to lead what's next in music. So we're always thinking about what's what's coming around the corner and try to get ourselves there. And then the other one is really focusing on the artists, in particular, the independent artist community. And that kind of gives us a path forward where so much of the change in the business is coming out of independent, self-releasing musicians, uh, musicians doing it themselves, and, and really sort of doubling down on SoundCloud's differentiator, which is the independent artist community. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like from my perspective, that independent artist piece has just what's been growing so much in the music industry. We've seen so much more music being uploaded to all the digital streaming providers more than we've seen. And in some ways, I feel like it's even faster than the rate of people being able to listen to music, which has been pretty fascinating. And I'm sure with that, there's plenty of opportunity that comes with that. But with any type of growth, it's probably just kind of like, whoa, how is this going to play out? What is this going to look like? What has that been like from your perspective? I mean, it's been phenomenal and, ast- and astronomical growth for us. And I'd, I'd say it's like attributed to probably a handful of things. I mean, one is you have, you know, creating music or sort of before the song is made, producing music right now, the cost to produce music has come way down. You know, you have digital tools, things like Splice, uh, the production software suites you can use. That used to be a really heavy effort to get in the studio. The second thing alongside of that is COVID really brought a lot of musicians home to start making music again. And that alongside the ability to make music effectively in the cloud creates a lot more music being made. The the third thing is then alongside of that is, you know, the idea of these independent self-releasing artists being the fastest growing part of the music ecosystem just all coincides with the first two pieces and it kind of creates an explosion of creativity and distribution. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing on SoundCloud to give you the stat, we added nearly an entire Spotify in terms of the number of tracks to our catalog at SoundCloud over the past year. So the rate of music being uploaded, and since we're user generated, we accept a lot more tracks being uploaded is, is, is shocking in a lot of ways. Um, and the last thing I would add is the notion of essentially artists being independent has become very powerful, right? It's not something, you know, where independence kind of in the past used to be niche. If you're an independent artist, you've got control over your sort of your masters, you're distributing yourselves, you know where to go from social media for promotion and audience development. So, and you hear a lot of the major stars like Kanye and, you know, obviously Taylor Swift saying something about that too, but all of those things kind of combine, kind of create a perfect storm for the independent, independent artist. And I feel like that independent piece, especially with the tools and the resources that artists want, I think that's created a lot of opportunity for you all at SoundCloud with that. And I know that you've broken out the business in two main areas. You have your listeners and then you have your creators as well. And it would be great to hear how both of those businesses individually are doing. It seems like we got a little bit of taste of it, but I guess if we can start with the listener side, how has that side of the the business been? It's good. And, and the first thing is we're actually calling it our, it's, it's fans, not listeners. So we're really doubling down on the notion of fandom versus just people coming to access a catalog of music. I mean, a lot of the other streaming services, you can log in, search, discover, hit a playlist, listen to any track you want, and it's incredible. But we're, we're really doubling down with SoundCloud is really talking about the fan and the fandom aspect. Um, so we've continued to build that business. Our traffic is strong. Revenues have been growing really nicely throughout the throughout the last two years. And we've also started to shift the model um, towards something we called fan-powered royalties. 
uh, which some other people in the past have called user-centric monetization or user-centric royalties. And that's really allowing us, and I can explain more how it works, connecting the fan and the artist directly um, so that someone's listening behavior actually affects the revenue an artist is receiving. Uh, and then the second part of our business, which fits very nicely into that, is actually we call it, it's a creator business. And that has both kind of a couple components. There's software products for musicians to upload and share their music and find fans. We offer now distribution from SoundCloud into all the other streaming services. Uh, and then at the very sort of highest level of that, we're starting to work directly with talent as well. Um, and we have some big plans along all three of those parts, from both software to helping artists distribute their music to us kind of in some ways potentially building our own roster. Let's go back to the, the fan piece for a second, because I think the fan powered royalties was a really big announcement that you all had. And yeah, as you mentioned, some people call it user centric. And for folks listening, I think that the most basic way is knowing that a lot of people almost mistakenly had the assumption that artists and the revenue that they're getting from streaming. If you listen to an artist, you are more you are paying them directly based on the amount you consume. But it really wasn't that way for a majority of it you all decided to do that. And I think the main focus of that has been to let's serve the artists themselves, especially if you are supporting an independent artist or you're supporting someone that isn't yeah. just part of the mainstream cog, it's more likely to benefit them. And you had some examples about how it did benefit those artists. And I guess it'd be great to hear what some of those insights are, or if there's any key learnings for the months so far that you've had that, because I think that's one of the things that could help solve some of the challenges that indie artists have felt in the streaming era. Right. So, and, and you know, sort of the basics are, so we have fan powered royalties turned on for, let's say, a large portion of our, of our creators, not everyone. So major labels, a lot of independent labels are not yet participating. But for artists that are, that we have in our program, um, we're able to directly connect someone's listening to their revenue participation. And you, you'd assume most streaming services work this way, but they don't. It's actually complicated formulas and correlating information and listening time share. And, and so it actually becomes less directly connected. So we made that connection so it's a direct stream between what I listen to. When I listen to an artist, my money goes to that artist. Um, what are, you know, we launched this in April. So we have about four or five, actually about four months of information on it so far. And our initial thinking on how it would work is actually holding really true. And the, the main thesis is any artist has, you know, people who come to listen to their music and want to discover that artist. They've also got people who come in by and listen to their music through a playlist or through a recommendation, but they don't really know that artist yet. And then you've got fans and the fans are the ones that are unable to really contribute to an artist today directly. And so the way our model works is actually shifts the royalties into more and more artists with deeper fan bases. So to give you a few stats, when we're looking at the payouts that we're making on the fan power royalty basis, 80% of the payouts are coming from about 20% of the fans. And so you're able to now actually see if you're an artist and you're logged in, you're able to soon see like, oh, I know who those 20% are. Those are my true fans. The other folks are just a kind of experimenting or listening to my music a little bit. That makes sense. And I think that for artists who, let's say that they were probably using or relying on another platform, if they're seeing those stats, I would assume that that would probably help you then attract more artists. And then that in turn can then attract their fans too. Yeah. I mean, we've seen gen on average, I mean, there's even more powerful stats. On average, you know, artists that are participating are seeing 55% lift in their revenue overall. So a massive uptick in revenue. Um, we've seen about, and we've seen artists about 25% lift in overall number of artists participating since we announced it too. So we're seeing more artists come in and each incremental artist makes more money. Um, and, and it really does work. If you've got a dedicated fan base, I mean, I, the, one of the things that always sort of, one of the key things that kind of irks me about streaming right now is if I'm a fan and I want to spend $50 on listening to either Dan's music, I can't, I'm not going to go buy Amazon and Apple and Spotify. Um, and so you're kind of limited because no one, they're all sort of complementary services. But if I have money to spend, uh, I should be able to participate with that artist. Now I can buy merch or things, but it's not directly around the music itself. 
And so we're trying to flip that on its head and actually say there's a pathway for those fans to really engage directly with that artist. Mm. And let's talk a little bit more about that pathway, because I feel like this is a stepping stone to that in a lot of ways. Artists have so much power in all of the things that they can do through monetization. I think we've seen that in the highest levels with whether it's an artist like a Kanye or Rihanna or Jay-Z, what they've been able to do. But I think that reality is true for many other artists that aren't even at their level either. So I feel like in a lot of ways, the fan power royalty is a step towards what could it further look like in terms of the artist's stack or the artist's suite of services and things that they offer and how SoundCloud could potentially be a platform for something like that? Yeah, exactly. It, it is a 100% a stepping stone. So when now you know if you've got a 1,000 people who listen to your music and 100 of them are fans, we can give you the information to say, I, who are those 100 fans I have? Oh, wait a minute. I know who those 100 fans are. I can now speak to them directly. And if I can speak to them directly, maybe I can get paid by them directly. And then that opens up a whole new sort of way that artists and fans can engage. Um, and it then, you know, ultimately leads you down into, you know, Web3 and blockchain and all the things that you're sort of able to sort of create once you have that, that direct connection. And, and that's why it becomes a stepping stone. It also allows the artist to really market differently too. You know, most artists right now are putting on pre-save links through, you know, listen to my track when it comes out on, on Spotify, trying to get yourself into a playlist. But if I know I can point towards a service or towards services that, that have a direct fan base, then I know who those fans are and they're going to listen to me and I know how to engage them, changes the dynamic direct, you know, differently too. And this is something that I think we've seen a lot in gaming as well, just some of the dynamics you see there in terms of how popular gamers connected with their fans, whether they're using Twitch and things like that. And it feels like music is getting to that same point. It's ironic because I feel like music most times leads the way in so many things, but now it's following another industry. But I think a lot of that is true because yeah, gaming, Web3, NFTs, and a lot of the platforms now, that is what the evolution of this looks like. I think that there are some artists that are doing some cool things there. The cool, the, the question I have for you though, because it's something you had mentioned earlier, it seems like I understand the pathway for what it looks like for indie artists, but you mentioned that some of the major labels haven't necessarily came on board with it yet. What do you think that is? Is there a hesitation there or has there just been more adoption from indie artists so far? Well, I think it's one is it's, it's a different system. So anything different, you have to sort of make sure you prove out that it works. Um, we're doing so. We've had various conversations with major labels, large independent labels, um, very healthy conversations. But anytime you introduce something new into an established industry, there's you know initially met with either interest or skepticism. We've kind of been met with both. Now, we're able to do it because unlike other streaming services, we have a unique base of artists that we have a direct relationship with. But over time, we are, we're definitely eager to expand this because, you know, it doesn't really matter in a lot of ways whether you're an independent artist or you're Kanye or you're Drake releasing a track. If Drake could know who is true, one mil I mean, for Drake, it's probably millions of really big fans. But if he could know them and have a direct relationship closer to them, that's, that's really powerful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even look at his numbers. I, I know that a lot of these billboard numbers are backed in from streaming, but I think his last album was like six, like 600,000 for a certified lover boy. If there was a way to be able to track, okay, who are those people that fed into that? Then he just has a lot more power. We just haven't seen that necessarily, but I think that's what the next option there could look like. Um, one more okay. question if you on the fan power yeah. royalty piece though. Um, because I know that this has been something talked about by some of the other DSPs, and it seems as if some of them had concerns about it because of the cost related to administer something like this. How has that been from your perspective? How has it been from a cost perspective? And you know, what does the cost benefit look like in terms of managing fan power royalties? It's the same expense for us as doing anything else. I Honestly, I think either we built it better than everyone or someone's not telling the truth because you know, we've really seen this be, you know, as a cost effective and simple to calculate in a lot of ways, actually just as easy. I mean, we were able to tell, you know, I know if you, I know if you had a user account, I could tell that you listened to my music 
you should be able to connect the revenue to those two things. So yeah, I think others have had challenges to do this technically. Uh, I give kudos to our to our engineering and our product teams and our our royalty teams who built it for SoundCloud. But yeah, we haven't seen any sort of uptick in expenses and um, challenge anyone to see why it really has to be that way. Mm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, because I remember that was one of the big challenges you kept hearing. And then when you all launched it, everyone was asking you that question. So it's good to hear that that isn't the case. It's good to hear that isn't the case. No. It'd be good to hear, and let's it'd be good to talk a little bit more about the Web3 piece of this and just where that future looks like for SoundCloud. What are you envisioning? What does that roadmap look like for how you can serve a lot of these artists? So without getting too in the weeds on Web3, crypto and all that, I think the fundamental notion of what a Web3 platform can provide is very powerful. I mean, the fact that both the artist participating and the fan participating have a have really a direct, in a lot of ways, potential ownership stake in that, in the outcome of that success of that platform, that's incredibly powerful and it's something we'd love to explore. Two is the, one of the, the things that I think music has is that as a fan, I want to show to other fans how much of a fan I am. And it's like, I was the first person to listen to, you know, Billie Eilish before she broke and got a Grammy. And that being, being able to show that to your friends, to your other people in your network, to your community is, is incredibly powerful. It's the idea of status. And right now it's very difficult to show off in streaming services, but status is something that any music fan really sort of wants as well. It is a little bit, you know, there's some ego involved with that, but that's just human nature. So with Web3, you both get an ownership component, plus you also get to be able to actually express your status um, in a digital format. And that's, those two things together are sort of inherently music is like the perfect art form and the perfect medium for that to come together in. I think we're in very early stages of this. It's kind of hearing a lot of the more sort of broad thinkers on the space say we're probably at the you know, just as mobile was being developed, this Web3 is kind of in year one or two of really being developed. Um, and then once someone, either SoundCloud or others, start to develop a very compelling consumer experience around that, it could really break open because of those first two things. Because I, I also think that just given where you are and with SoundCloud and some of the other distributors and maybe even certain DSPs as well, you're probably better positioned to lead that front because I think that some of the other DSPs that are more reliant on major labels, they're going to be the ones that are more likely to, let's say, follow the trend, just given some of the dynamic of some of the bigger companies involved and all it takes to have, you know, the major artist on, let's say, a Republic or another label that's under one of the majors to make a move as opposed to some of these indie artists that are on the cutting edge. So... Correct. I feel yeah. like you and a few others will be leading that front. Yeah, and we're, we have some things in the in in the works right now. We're we have a small team working on it. We're trying to figure out what the right thing is. You know, a lot of it right now is still ancillary in terms of like NFTs and some of the other things that are happening. But we're trying not to make it just a side project, a nice sort of you know thing that artists can do on the side, and actually make it more of a core of to what we're doing. So stay tuned. We're, we're figuring out the ways through this like everyone else. But, you know, we definitely, similar to F, similar to way, the way we produce fan-powered royalties, us being able to offer products and solutions built around Web3 is something that we definitely have an advantage to do. And I feel like this ties back to a point that I heard you made in a recent interview. You were talking about how artists are releasing music, especially indie artists, releasing music so fast. And that is not matching just the ability and the rise of listenership that we're seeing on the other end. And you were saying that because of that, we probably may need or should see the standard model of payments, which is this $10, you know, all you can consume subscription being the standard. And why do you think that that will eventually change? And what do you see as that moving forward? Yeah, I think it, it kind of touches on what we discussed before. So I think the research is from Medea, uh, Media is that you, you, know, you have 5 million, in last year you had 5 million self-releasing artists going through things like DistroKid or SoundCloud, what we offer. Uh, and that's growing at 
30% plus year over year. Streaming overall globally is growing at 10%. So you just say, wait a minute, there's more artists incrementally than there is enough revenue in the space. You know, artists are growing faster than revenue. And so what that means is it's actually kind of a contraction. And I, the revenue model is actually needs to expand and offer more solutions, more monetization. You know, everything from ad supported to subscription to various forms of transactions, because without that, you're actually constraining the growth of the industry. And so a lot of things we're doing is, you know, I think back to your point you just made is like gaming is a great example of this. You go into Fortnite and you can buy everything. And there's all sorts of ways to add skins and worlds and all of those different components. And it's not a one size fits all model today in music. I think it's still too much of a one size fits all model. The industry's back to growth and it's been fantastic to see music be one of the fastest growing parts of entertainment, but there's a next evolution that I think we're just on the early stages of crossing into. Yeah, that's a good point because it makes me think overall just about not even just the price that the current DSP model set up, but also just the mentality of how it's spread. I think that this $10 subscription, it's in this way where the DSPs are ideally going to capture, you know, let's say maybe 10 or if they're lucky, maybe 20% of all those people that listen to it, let's thinking more so about Spotify here, they would be able to get, you know, majority of the folks on free still, but you know, with the subset that are on paid will bring in more revenue. However, what I think that gaming recognized in SoundCloud, they're like, or not, or, or Fortnite specifically, they were able to say, okay, how can we monetize not necessarily the 10 or 20%, but how can we monetize that 1% or that 0.1% of people that is going to want to buy that high end thing? What does that look like? And I think that ties into the things we were talking about earlier, whether it's your NFTs or buying into these tokens and things like that for artists. So it's a complete shift in terms of how the monetization looks like, but the numbers could actually be potentially higher than where it may be if you know everyone is paying the same flat rate. Oh, I think exactly. that's really interesting. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, in Fortnite, you can buy things that don't actually help you play the game. You just buy things because it makes yourself look cooler. Uh, in music, I can't do that right now. I mean, you can, you can, and, and I think that's accelerated by COVID where a lot of people are still at home and I used to do that through merchandise, but the idea of like virtual merchandise and status symbols in streaming services has to come to life. Um, and, it, and again, I think we're like right about to start to see some of these models. You have a lot of that coming in diff starting to build up in different markets. The kind of US EU market is still sort of centered around that $10 equivalent subscription though. Mm. Yeah. And it, it makes me think about, I don't know if you remember that report, but there was this report about some Birkin bag or some type of expensive bag that was sold in one of these digital environments. I forget if it was Fortnite or Roblox, but yeah. it sold for a higher yeah. amount than the actual physical bag. I mean, you should see like some of the NFT art with people. I mean, it's being, it's, it's, you have, you have digital art in sort of the crypto form being sold for much more than any physical artwork. So it, it's, it's, you can get very heady here and say in 20 years, we're all going to be living in some sort of digital version of reality or some blended version of reality. And so there's no difference between a digital good and a physical good. Um, but that that model is starting to, you're starting to see that when there's Birkin bags being sold in games that are more expensive than the real thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Wild. It's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. Well, I mean, speaking of gaming, I know that you all had partnered with Fortnite earlier this year, there was this tournament that you all had done. And I thought that was cool. It was also cool because I think Rico Nasty was involved. It was cool to see women involved in gaming in that type of way. And I feel like that's pro that has to just be the point. You all probably have future moves specifically in gaming in some of these environments as well. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing more. I mean, we're one of the big areas of, of focus for us is how to, how to enable SoundCloud within gaming environments. Also just to help artists, you know, a lot of most artists and most of fans on who use SoundCloud today are, are gamers. Uh, and so there's just a huge overlap. Um, and a lot of those times that people are playing games or listening to music too. It's doesn't, you know, can't, it's not either or it's a lot of and. Yeah. And so earlier this year, um, we decided we partnered with Fortnite. We built a custom SoundCloud world in conjunction with them. We had eight musicians go head to head in a Fortnite battle hosted by Rico Nasty, who also did a performance and we live streamed it on Twitch. And we actually, I think at that night, we were the, I think we were the number one 
non-gaming uh, live stream on Twitch that night. So we actually hit some pretty big numbers in terms of the audience. And, and we're going to do more things like that, both bring artists together in gaming and put SoundCloud into gaming environments because that's where people are consuming now. It's not always just in a you know, streaming app. It's in, it's in different places. And as more, as we said, as more of the world becomes this kind of digital metaverse, to say a cliche word right now, um, that, that's going to be more of what we're going to be doing. Mm. And I feel like this market is just so hot in general. Um, 2021 has obviously been a big year. Universal recently had their public listing. This market is just so hot in so many ways. And I feel like that's probably expanding things beyond. Are there any areas that we haven't talked about yet? I know we covered gaming and Web3, but are there any other emerging areas that you're like, oh yeah, no, this is something that we're going to tap into. Definitely. This is something we're gonna I think into? the other two areas, I mean, the the what we're offering independent artists and creators is, is more and more tools and solutions to stay independent longer. So we're, you'll see us release over the next six to 12 months, um, more products, clearer products for artists. Um, we're working more and more directly with artists, sometimes on our own um, to help build them up and you know, hopefully help them become superstars, but also sometimes in conjunction with, with independent major labels as well. And, and the idea that we're really trying to build is, you know, we're really calling SoundCloud a, a modern music entertainment business, is the idea of having both artist relationships and consumer relationships or fan relationships at the same time. Right now in music, everything's a little bit to one side or the other. You're either a label and you don't really have a direct connection to a consumer or a fan, or you're a streaming service and you don't really have a direct connection to the artist. We're trying to bridge that gap um, and try to become, bring those things closer and closer together. Mm. I like how you mentioned the, the music entertainment piece, because I was going to ask you about that. I know that you had mentioned that, at least for SoundCloud, you wanted to stay focused on music specifically, and that there were other uh, digital stream providers that have got, looked and focused in non-music audio. Can you talk more about why you made that decision to stay focused on music as opposed to other forms of, you know, non-music audio or other types of entertainment? Yeah, there's, there's so much opportunity in music. It's, it's, I'm very much a big believer in focus. And the, one of the things we try to do here is we always try to do less things, not more things and building things for music fans, building products for music artists and creators, helping artists succeed. You've got to be really good at what you do, and you have to be focused in order to do that. Uh, and so by going into podcasting, which a lot of people think is a natural extension, I mean, the way you do it is fantastic, but it's different than going into a studio and releasing music and trying to promote your music on social media and streaming services. Um, it's also a different consumer experience. Podcasts are you know, 30 minutes long. Most tracks are two minutes. Uh, there's transcribing and all the other things that you have to, to be really good at podcasts, you have to be focused on that. And so it's basically a, it's a choice that we made, uh, at SoundCloud and we're saying there's so much opportunity in music, but we've got to be really good at music. Uh, and you can't be good at everything. I get that. And I think just seeing how some of the other companies have played it, a, it's a really long play as I think we've seen by so many of these other companies, podcasts take a while to grow. And even if they're making these nine figure investments in popular podcaster networks. I think it takes a long time to see the ROI on that. And I think it's just so different. Like for instance, I think the biggest value you add I've seen for a lot of them is how can they find a way to combine their music library with the opportunity to do audio so that you can combine the two of those. But even that you're still creating a whole different platform with that. It's such a different experience. So I do think that the focus, you know, I think there's pros and cons for sure, but I do think the focus on music can help more so because I think there's a lot of artists out there that they don't necessarily want to start a podcast or like that isn't their focus necessarily. Yeah. And it's, it's a great promotional tool for artists. It's great listening. I mean, I listen to podcasts and I listen to music, um, you know, and a lot of the other streaming services use it to, to steer costs. Music is expensive. Um, you know, you have to support the artist base, both recorded and publishing. So I, you know, I do believe a lot of the other streaming services look at it and say, oh, podcasting, even though it costs us a lot of money, it actually may in the long run be less expensive than music. 
And we're just not making that that call to say we're going to try to do both of those things at the same time. It's kind of like trying to be a, um, a cable provider that you're offering sports and news and, you know, shows. That's great, but that's really just a distributor of all, all sorts of things. It's not just focused on one. We have to focus on one. Mm -hmm. And do you look at video the same type of way, even if it's music related video, but do you, do you look at video in terms of, no, we're focused on the audio piece of music as opposed to, you know, having it in that same type of way? No, actually video, I think is music's a visual medium. Um, you know, as fans, you see music live, it's visceral, you can kind of feel it differently. So, you know, we, we right now in our, in our, in our app, you'll see it's primarily audio only, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're, you know, we have religion around that. We do believe that video is a, is a core part of music. Um, and so, and the, the, and it doesn't necessarily need to be like music videos, but the interaction that a fan has is goes deeper than just listening to music too. Um, and so many musicians right now, they're, they're visual aesthetic, they're creative, they're doing things outside of just the track, listening to the track this, that you really need to feel and see to actually get understanding with that artist. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. So tying back to the music entertainment business that, you, um, that you're building and what you're calling the future of SoundCloud right now, I want to go back to another thing that I've heard other people talk about in the industry. I, um, I know that a few of the record label execs have just talked about how hard it is to acquire new listeners or to just increase things in general. And I think this ties back to some of the other things that we talked about just in terms of artists and the amount of music they're putting out is just over, you know, matched compared to, or they are doing so much more compared to actual music listening increasing. And for you all, I'm curious, how has that affected some of the stats and things that you looked at? I know last time we talked about it, you said that, you know, that your customer acquisition costs and your lifetime value ratios were right in line. But have you noticed any increases or, you know, decreases with that, just given the amount of music that has just been released in the past few years specifically? We haven't seen any major increases in the cost to the cost cost of customer acquisition or CAC. It's 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 held pretty consistent, but you have to keep up with it literally weekly. I mean, there's things that you know as you're trying to build, and this is even for any artist. You're trying to build, you know, same thing. We're trying to build audiences. We're trying to get people to use our products and services. We're trying to resonate out there in the market, and so. You know, you have to be able to both understand what's happening. Things are changing. I mean, privacy changes are changing like, you know, monthly. I mean, Apple's changing a lot of the ecosystem with what they're doing through their privacy and data data sharing right now. Um, you're also having to keep up with uh, a lot of people who are throwing a lot more things out there at once. And so it doesn't necessarily change the way the, the cost of us trying to do business, but it changes the way you have to keep up in the pace. And interestingly, I think over the past year and a half, for during COVID, things have gotten more, have gotten faster. The rate of innovation has gotten faster. The rate of people trying new things, the rate of people experimenting with different marketing tactics and both creatively and sort of on the more analytical side of it, it's just all going faster. And so you just have to keep running at it as fast as you can to keep up. Mm, oh, I bet. And I know last time we talked, you mentioned that the Middle East and Egypt specifically were some of the fastest growing areas that you've had. Is that still the case? Or are there any other areas that have been pretty strong recently? Yeah, there was, <clears throat> was definitely seeing growth in, in the Middle East um, in particular has still been unbelievably strong for us. We're, we're starting to start to see how we can sort of, you know, be more proactive in the market there. Um, we're seeing a lot of up and coming musicians now. Most of those musicians, they're still generally the way we think about it is like, you know, 80% of the music that's listened to in a country comes from that country. So in the US, for example, eight, 70 to 80% of the music listened to in the US is from US based musicians. In Egypt, 70 80% of the music that's listened to in Egypt is not from Trippy Red and Drake and all the US hip hop artists that we see in the US, it's coming from local Egyptian musicians. And so right now we're still seeing that growth, but what we're really now trying to figure out is how do we get teams on the ground? How do we help support those artists? 
you know, the music ecosystem works differently in different markets. And so we're trying to understand how we can take that to our advantage. We're also seeing growth in Brazil, Latin America, and, and Southeast Asia. So uh, a lot of the same trends that are happening in, in the U.S. and the EU are translating over there as well. Mm, that makes sense. Because I imagine that there's certain things that are probably consistent, like you may have your, whether it's your your select sessions or your meetups that you'll have in different areas. I know you've had them at different conferences and stuff like that, or areas in the U.S. And I'm sure that some of those things are, you know, the same in the Middle East. But are there any specific things that are like, oh, this is something new that we've done in this region because it is related to the ecosystem there and it's not something that would necessarily work somewhere else? It's a great question. Um, I mean, we've done, we've gone and started to do things where we're going in more proactively. We just, you know, we have a series that we call scenes on SoundCloud where we find not necessarily new genres, but new kind of combination between genres and locations. So one of the, one of the scenes we're focused on is East, East African underground and that we did a few things and we, and a lot of it's the same, but a lot of it's slightly different. You have to go in and do it. We do go in and do events down locally um, we try to help artists collaborate that they wouldn't have collaborated otherwise. Uh, some of the things that you probably are probably slightly different internationally is the ways to generate artists revenue for artists. So for example, in the Middle East, you know, the idea of a $10 subscription that people pay for doesn't really exist. It's a lot of it's built through the mobile provider. There's a lot more branded opportunities versus music direct opportunities. And so you start to see some of the nuances. But for the most part, it's artists trying to make music, trying to find fans, us trying to provide audiences for those artists and provide the products that we can. So a lot of it's the same, but there's always these nuances too. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. So much of it is going to be the same regardless. But yeah, I think I thought a lot about the willingness and the ability to pay in so many of these other regions of the world that $10 a month is not going to cut in some of these regions, $2 a month hasn't been able to cut it. I think that's definitely impacted some of the companies that are a bit more reliant on the $10 a month subscription, but I think it does end up trickling to everyone in some type of ways. So yeah, I've seen branding, I've seen some other things. So it's going to be really interesting to see just how that all plays out because everyone wants international growth, but that international growth is just going to have to look very different depending on the country. Yeah, it looks very different. And, and I think one of the things where International growth doesn't mean you find an artist in Egypt and that artist blows up in the U.S. It means you got to make sure that artist really works in Egypt. And that's where you go into the sort of the different ways you need to sort of build up in the ecosystem there. Um, in a lot of these markets, there also isn't the established label ecosystem, too. So the idea of it being an independent artist is kind of for a lot of people, it's the only way forward. You may not have a Republic or an Interscope or a, you know, knocking at your door to sign a big deal because there just isn't, the, there aren't those labels. Now, a lot of the major labels and others are starting to put in infrastructure, um, but it's still very early days. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. No, I've seen a lot of that too. All right. Well, we're getting to the tail end, but before we let you go, one of the things that you had mentioned on our last interview was how you had seen SoundCloud as a accelerator, if you will, somewhere in that seed or series a stage for an artist and then you know they can accelerate on to some of the things they've done but i feel like before we had that con or since we've had that conversation we've seen so much about the creator economy and things just expanding and i have to imagine that some of that's probably expanded as well where this isn't just an accelerator this is probably a place where people can stay and it can accelerate your career but just given everything that we've seen in terms of artists being able to sustain and do what they've done, they can continue to find a home for that. And that's exactly. what I've seen. What are your, what are your thoughts? That's a very good way to put the way what we're trying to build. I mean, it goes everything from uploading my first track to finding my fans, to building a fan base, to wait, Oh, I can distribute music into other streaming services. And now SoundCloud can really help me build my career. Yeah, it's in a lot of ways, we're trying to be the home base for that artist to build out their career. And artists will always, you know, decide we're not sort of, we never sort of constrain an artist to go somewhere else if they want to. Um, but we're trying to put in the pieces along that puzzle. So it's not just an accelerator, it's a little bit more than that, and then a little bit more than that, and a little bit more than that, and we continue to build. And so you'll see us kind of do everything from products and technology that service hundreds of thousands, if not millions of artists, 
to things that, you know, service potential superstars as well. Nice. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Well, Mike, this has been a pleasure. Thanks again for coming on. But before we let you go, is there anything else that you'd like to plug or let the Trapital audience know about? Keep doing what you're doing, Dan. <laughs> Love reading the <laughs> posts. They actually, uh, they help us quite a bit think through things or you confirm a lot of the same thoughts that we have. So I'll give you a plug back. Great stuff. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Right. Talk to you soon. Right. Bye now.